Thank you. So, um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about increasing your productivity through asset information collection, assets being buildings, things in buildings. But really, we're going to talk about, you know, really, you know, why we're doing it, uh, and and also kind of make you think about ways you can do it, uh, and. You know, we do want to make this uh, a little bit interactive. We also recognize that it is Thursday. Some people have been here since Saturday, it sounds like, or Sunday, possibly. Um, so uh, it's been a long week for a lot of folks. Uh, a lot of nights out on 6th Street, not necessarily <laughs> getting in as much sleep as we do back home. Um, so we're going to keep it a, a little bit light, and you're going to notice a theme of the presentation here pretty soon. Uh, but we want to do keep this uh, a bit interactive. It's only a half hour, so it's going to be uh, pretty quick. And we want to leave some room for discussion or questions uh, at the end. Um, so we are with the uh, Akita box. Um, you guys probably saw me up for two minutes yesterday, talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, at the core, Akita box uh, is a data company, as most software companies are but we're all about building data, and we're all about getting you the data, collecting it, and putting it in whatever form you need to help better manage your facilities. Uh, and that could even be to another platform as well. Um, so uh, that's me up there. That's my picture, and I had a little more hair. Uh, so I was an Army officer for about 10 years. I got out of the Army after being a company commander and said, what the heck do I do? I thought I was going to be selling hip implants or something. Didn't really know this was a career. Kind of found facility management. Uh, realized that I could use some of my, a little bit of my background in, in education uh, there. And I found myself working in higher education. So I've been on the other side of the chairs here, literally. So um, I was a facility manager at Millican University, which is a small private college in central Illinois, out in the prairie, and then most recently at SMU in Dallas, and that's where Josh poached me from a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, I realized there's even more stuff to do in facility management uh, than just manage the facility, so you can help people manage it. Uh, so now I'm a business development executive and facility management consultant. Uh, at Akita Box, that's my contact info. Uh, if you want, this will be published on the website, or you can grab a card from me uh, as well. And in addition to all that, I also make slideshows, and Josh doesn't. So Josh, what would you say you do here? And then I made this bio up for him as best I could. Appreciate it. Because he didn't want to do it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I am one of the co-founders. Um, we're actually going to turn four officially as a comp software company this month in August. Um, we've gone from five people to over 90 people in that period of time. Uh, we're now in 32 states. And really, my background was in construction project management, actually BIM. Um, I, was, I was laughing. It's actually been a decade that I've come to this specific conference. Um, and I used to speak with my old company on building information modeling and how we do that through construction to make everything better. And then I started to realize that wow, this was a really good pitch, but what I realized is now I started meeting the people who had to operate the building, and I'd hand them this thing on a thumb drive, and they'd go, thanks, and they put it in the back of their drawer because they had no idea how to use the data. And we were putting really good data into these models, and we were handing these really cool 3D models, and this was back in you know, early 2011, and these facility managers were going, I'm stuck in a wall. Right, and, and they can't get through the model, and we realize quickly that there's a huge gap in the industry, and that gap is, how do we take all that valuable knowledge and put it into the systems that you actually need to survive a, as a university in this case, um, but really as a business? Because there's a lot of wasted time and money spent in not having data, when in fact you have really good data at turnover. And for some reason, it all disappears, and I know the reasons, right? It, it's, there's not a method to do it and there's not a place to keep it and archive it and push it to other places. So I used to talk about source of truth out of Revit and BIM. And really we're now taking it to a whole different level because there's things that you can't do in BIM for instance. I can't truly attach and associate an O&M manual directly in Revit. 
it's not a file management or file storage system. I can't put photos in there. I can do the make model serial number, but I can't create a logical drop down for how we actually assign uh, classroom codes. So for instance, when you're doing classroom codes, you may be selecting a category and then there should only be two other options for you. And a lot of times you can't do that in Revit. And so we really built a key to box on the idea that we want to stay somewhat software agnostic, a little bit like Revit is, and be able to play with all of these other companies in the sandboxes because we can't possibly develop everything that you all need. But we can definitely hold that data, get you good data, and create that source of truth with everything, not just the location and data, but all of those supporting documents and reports and inspections. Um, a lot of you, if you have healthcare you know, within your universities, CMMS is a big deal. And when a CMMS inspector comes through and asks you, when was the last time that you did that fire door? Joint commission. Or joint commission, I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> joint commission, you know, when was the last time you did that fire door? It's really powerful when the technician actually opens up the iPad and goes, which fire door, that one, that one, or that one? And you can click on it, open it up, and it shows you all of the data and the last time you did that. Joint commission becomes a heck of a lot easier when they know that you're in a platform that holds that data in a meaningful way. Yeah, so Josh went over kind of the why Akita Box was started, Josh being one of the four co-founders. Um, we, like you said, we, we're just gonna have our fourth anniversary here coming up the, later this month. Uh, I put that little plus by 75 because we're at like 79 or 80 now. We just oh, hired some people this week, I think. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we're, we're continually growing. To give you all perspective, uh, when I started just a little over two years ago, um, I think my official employee number is 37, but we had about 30 people when I started. So that's the kind of growth uh, that we're experiencing because you know, we see that folks have the need for good data and a good way to store it. Um, and so we've, we've uh, actually gone and, let's see, is this a laser pointer? Yeah, look at that. So we've actually done, uh, gone out, collected facility data and done implementations of our software uh, either as a standalone platform or to feed other, other systems at about 250 million square feet across the United States. Josh, you know, mentioned the numbers, 37, 37 states was my last count, uh, but we'll see. Uh, and then uh, we are based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we, that's where uh, Josh and I are both based out of, um, but we uh, we're starting to have some folks be remote, so we're starting to get little pockets around the country. Uh, but we will go anywhere in the US hoping to get a Canadian project here pretty soon as well. Uh, but we go anywhere, we go to your facility, uh, we come to you because we realize you don't have the time to do it. Um, so uh, a little bit more about us. So we, uh, last two years, have been named the most customer-centric facility management software company by Build Magazine with their facility management awards. If any of you read Build, uh, and we've also been, um, for the past two years, been the best medium-sized company, uh, best places to work in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, not only do we do great stuff for you, but we have fun uh, while we do it. But you know what? I don't really like to talk about our flair that much. So you're gonna notice a theme here in my gifts. All right. So. Uh, we're going to I'm going to talk a little bit about the building life cycle and then Josh is going to talk a little bit more about this. But, you know, it goes without saying everybody in here is some sort of facilities professional. We all know that while a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of money goes into design, construction, renovation of facilities, really where's the majority of that spend come, right? It's 30, 70, 80, 20, depending on, you know, which studies you read. Uh, but at the end of the day, most of that spend for that building in its life all comes in here in that facility management future planning cycle. And you see here now we can make it all circular and go back to BIM and everything else. But realistically, we know that you spend a ton of money on 
BIM standards and getting that data and getting all that construction data and then poof, to Josh's point, it used to go in binders, then it went in CD-ROMs, now it goes to flash drives. How easy is it to lose a flash drive now? Right, and really we know USB drives are notoriously fickle as well and uh, not the most stable uh, source of, uh, of memory. Uh, so we've got to have something else to do with that. So Josh has some other thoughts, I'm sure. You can go to the next one. We'll, okay. keep, we'll keep rolling. Okay. Um, Great. I mean, ultimately, right, we're really talking about cradle to cradle data validation. Yep. Right. And we want to make sure that your data is there. And, and I think one of the biggest things that we find, you know, with our clients is, okay, great, but how do I get started, right? What do we do? Because, yeah, I'm getting this great data and I have Revit models for my two newest buildings on campuses, but I have 43 other buildings that are in anywhere from nothing to CAD, right? And that's really hard then to start saying, well, I see all this cool stuff when I come to a conference like this, and boy, I'd really love to do you know, FM systems, asset works, Akita box. I don't care which one you choose, but I don't have my data in a standard format. And how do I even start doing that? And again, that's where you just have to start. <laughs> I mean, Amy knows, like, how many years did it take you to convert over to Revit? Uh, planning, it's probably four, three, four years. But you had to start. Yeah, and, I had to just pick a And I think that's a lot of people get stuck in that, like, start. And how do I start and where do I start? The fact is, you just start. And whether you're doing one building a month for the next 12 years or you're doing 10 a month for the next three months, you're on that path to getting that data. But if you don't start, you're never gonna get there. Yeah. And we found a lot of folks too will start that you know, CAD to Revit transition uh, really when they are doing some sort of construction turnover. Because now all of a sudden they are getting uh, information in these new formats, and that's the catalyst to start. So, um, who who in their who in their role deals with construction turnover processes in some way, shape, or form? I mean, probably, mo and, and even if you're not directly involved, you're probably indirectly affected by it, right? So, so those who who raise their hand, uh, is this kind of how construction turnover looks sometimes? <laughs> Right? Are we, you know, we're doing file copies, uh, you know, having three and a half inch floppy disks going everywhere. All right? Imagine, you know, think about how far we've come. So this, this movie came out 20 years ago, Office Space. And I mean, this was pretty high tech back then, you know, using, using floppy disks. I mean, you know, we don't even have CD-ROM drives in our computers anymore. So it's come a long, long way, right? But if you think about 1999, when that came out, a 20-year-old building really isn't that old. And think about the data and what was involved 20 years ago and, and really how far we've come. Um, but you know, from construction turnover, right? do you all have you know, like standards, published processes? Does everybody know that on your team? Are all your, you know, your architects, contractors, is everybody is everybody on the same page? <laughs> you wish. You wish, right? And it takes time, it takes effort, and it takes a lot of buy-in, right? And it takes other, <coughs> other folks who don't necessarily feel that pain of what you do uh, to actually make that happen, right? Because sometimes, you know, it should be, you know, very smooth and, and look in the stock photos, everybody's really, you know, huddling over the over the plans, right? How many, How often do we actually do that anymore, right? I mean, who actually prints everything out? Uh, you know, usually we do that on monitors, right? But sometimes when we deal with the technology, and you know, a file format isn't correct or it's corrupt, or you know, somebody brought up yesterday. Well, you know, I got this Revit, you know, file and the architect did it in 2019, and I haven't upgraded. And I'm still in 2018, and you can't do it. What do you feel like? <laughs> Right? You just feel like taking a bat to the computer every once in a while. Right? But it shouldn't be that hard. Right? We, we're, we're good enough, we're smart enough, where everybody should know what's going on. We should have those, um, you know, everybody on the same page, uh, standards published, but it's a lot easier said than done. 
So um, we talked a little bit about the construction process and didn't really get into it too much other than just kind of acknowledging it. But really what we want to talk a little bit more about is existing facilities. Because again, while there's a huge amount of construction going on on our campuses right now, again, think about buildings built in 1999. Those buildings that are you know, 20 years old now, what are we starting to have in those 20 year old buildings? We're starting to get new renovations. We're starting to have deferred maintenance. We're starting to change all, this, all these things out. And all of a sudden those as-built documents are not as built anymore. So how are we going through? How are we updating that? How are we getting a good inventory uh, of those existing facilities? What do we do most of the time? We just jump to conclusions and say, it's probably still that way, right? But do we have a formal audit process to get there? Or do we have somebody coming in to do an audit on a regular basis to make sure that that information is actually up to date and we aren't just jumping to conclusions? So, um, like I said, Akita Box, a lot of what we do is on-site data collection. We have the team, so we talked about how we have about 80 people. About half of that team is in our uh, implementation services team. So Kirk, who's actually out of the booth with us, he's probably in a conversation out there. He's one of our implementation managers. He leads one of those teams that goes out to your facility, collects that data, burns a lot of shoe leather to get that done. All right, and what does it start with? So for us, because of how our platform uh, is, uh, is location-based, it all starts with a floor plan. We have to have accurate floor plans, accurate space data, so we can not only, one, give you that good space data, but two, we can also associate all those assets that are inventoried with that correct space. Because, you know, oftentimes, too, what have we found, right? I found this, you know, in a previous life, too, is you almost have two separate inventories. You have your space inventory and your asset inventory. But is every asset in a space? Or is space an asset, right? I mean, we can even talk semantics, right? So every asset is in a space, and we have to ha make sure that all of those space management systems, CMMS, IWMS, all those systems have one single source of truth. And if we're auditing them, we're auditing them at the same time, and we're doing it in a controlled manner. Right. Or we could just assume that it'll just work itself out naturally, like Bob says up there, right? which probably isn't the best way to go about it. Right? So I talked a little bit about accurate floor plans. Right? So this is kind of, this is again, like I said, where we typically start with those accurate floor plans. Right? We, we you know, field validate, we take some measurements. We could even you know, use some other technology and scan if they're really bad, right? But again, then we have to communicate those, uh, those updates back to the space management team. They're doing it in CAD, they're doing it in Revit. They've got file versioning, all of this you know, goes together. Is anybody the CAD Revit person that updates plans at their facility? What's that? In Sorry. AutoCAD. In AutoCAD? OK. So, so what's that, that workflow kind of like? I'm putting you on the spot here. What's that workflow like when you know, somebody says, hey, we did a small renovation project. Here's what it was. You know, how does that workflow work to you? And then how does that all get updated? Well, we get the plans from the architect, the estimates. Mm -hmm. And then I go into the, into the base drawings that we had. And usually there's a lot of uh, exploding of blocks and <laughs> conversions of layers to match our standards and stuff, and then dropping it into our uh, to our base plans and updating. Okay. Uh, but it's a lot. Of, it's a very manual. Uh, yeah. Process. Yep. Okay. So then from there, then it's not just the plans, right? It's the database, the data. The, the data. And how many play? How many different play? Again, putting you on the spot here. How many different places does that space data have to go then? Well, we update the CATFM system, uh, okay. our, which we use Archibus, mm -hmm. and then there's a nightly feed that uh, feeds other systems. Okay. That runs overnight. So, okay. Very uh, good. That, that that's automated. That yeah, part of it. Three different yeah. um, applications get sped right. Right. And and you're lucky because you have that level of integration with all of those systems that 
you know, feed to a central data, like a SQL or Oracle database, I'm assuming, right? So you, you're lucky because those all feed together and th that process is all automated, but automating those processes is a, is a huge effort, right? And so that's, that's great that, you, that you're there. Um, and that's probably a, a great example of workflow and, and how it gets done and how you have all those things working together, right? Um, because you know, we also know too that, yeah, you've been alerted that that happens, right? But not all facilities are really are really good at communicating We're internally. Not always alerted. That's the other thing. Yeah, right. And and you can only update what you know. Correct. If you don't know what happened, how can you update it? Um, so, you know, right here, you know, people just decide that they want a window view, all of a sudden, and then they take down their cubicle wall. Right, um, but it's happened. Right, we've we've all seen the phantom walls that go up over a weekend and, or go down over a weekend, <laughs> overnight. You know the the guerrilla contractors that sneak into campus and do things without anybody knowing or approving. Right. So again, there's also that audit process. So in addition to those updates, it's also that spot check, that audit process that happens on a routine basis. And then how are you able to update, update those from the field? Uh, you know, there's all, all sorts of processes. There's different softwares uh, that you can use from an electronic standpoint. You know, there's things that are really prolific out there like Bluebeam that's, uh, you know, widely used, uh, not only in construction, but now on a lot of facility teams. Or, you know, some CAFMs have uh, markup tools. <coughs> Or we've got a markup tool within a key to box that you can use as well. Um, so we talked a little bit about space, but then it's also assets, right? And so as Josh talked about, one of the things that we that we know uh, doesn't necessarily translate from a facility management standpoint is you, know, you can get a lot of great information from a model. <laughs> But what you don't get is an actual representation of what the thing looks like out in the field. All right, it may look different. It may be slightly different. You don't have things like you know, the circuit directory necessarily in the model. You have to extract that information, and it's got to be all tied together. Well, there's a lot of information that you can pay to have a model be super interconnected and have all these dependencies in it and use tools like you know, Navisworks and Autodesk to illustrate this, but how does the technician actually get that to the field? Well, a lot of times the information can be there in a low-tech way, but you have to have the way for the technician to access it. So that's why, you know, you think about a picture, if you had pictures of all your circuit directories and all of your breaker panels where a technician could see it, how much time would you save in a year? Right, think about that, that going back and forth, going, you know, trying to find the correct, the correct panel, you know, trying to go and open everything up. Well, if you can actually scroll through those pictures within a system and know that without having to go there, think about the time, the effort that you're saving, right? So we're starting to go a little bit beyond what BIM can do and see what we actually need from a facilities operation standpoint. All right, that was easy, right? We just went and took some pictures. Well, where do those pictures live? Do they live in a SharePoint? Do they live in a CAFM? Do they live in an IWMS? Do they live in a CMMS? Right? Where do those where do those actually live? And are those a single source of truth? Right? And then also are you auditing this on a regular basis? But the nice thing is now, what do I'm gonna generalize, because I still had a couple years ago technicians that would carry flip phones. Uh, but what do most technicians have on them right now when they're out in the field? They have some sort of smart device, whether it's a phone, whether it's an iPad. They can access that data, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give WashU a shout out because they have, put, uh, they have put wireless routers in all of their, um, mechanical, in all their space. mechanical spaces, which is awesome. So yeah. all of their technicians can be connected all of the time because you know we go to facilities all the time where great you step into the mechanical room and all of a sudden you don't have wi-fi right so um another thing that we 
you know, that we've started to look at and incorporate into our, our platform, and there's others, people use multi-vista and other things during construction, but 360 photos. Now you think about a 360 photo, use a 360 camera, as opposed to paying for an Oculus headset and, and, and you know, VR. Well, this is really poor man's VR here, right? You're getting a 360 immersive view. By the way, the hardware is not that expensive either. And then as long as you have a, a platform where you can view it, all of a sudden you're in business, all right? Now we're talking about virtual reality at a very cheap cost. All right, so we talked a little bit yesterday too about some of the other methods because you know we don't have floor plans. They're just, you know, they've been lost, dog ate them. Wherever they've gone, we don't have them anymore or it's just so out of date that we just need to start over from scratch. Well, we can use some other methods, laser scanning, use that point cloud to form, you know, a basic space model. And then from there, we've captured a bunch of data. We can build out a higher level of detail of the model over time or to whatever the client needs, All right? So uh, we can go through, this is an example of an indoor scan, kind of cool, All right? Um, we can also do uh, exterior scans. No, it didn't play. There we go. Uh, so we can do exterior scans of buildings, right? Get takeoffs. Think about the value of building, you know, uh, a nice, uh, level of detail model for your exterior of your buildings, right? Those are kind of the forgotten plans is those exterior facade plans. Uh, and then, so this is an example of, you know, this is kind of the combination of the point cloud that we get via LIDAR, and then you can see we put a roof on it. And now we've got, you know, a pretty cheap BIM there that looks pretty darn good. And, you know, we did it you know, fast, cheap, easy enough, right? But that looks really good. Do we have all the piping and all the wiring everywhere in the walls? No, but we've created a really good shell. And now we've got what that facility information model that then we can use really valuable information from. All right, and a little bit about CMMS, right? You know, if you could go ahead and do that, that would be great. Because by the way, we bought a new CMMS and we don't have any data in it. So can you just go ahead and populate that in all your free time? All right, uh, thanks Lumberg. All right, and then uh, some other things that we're starting to incorporate in our software that other people are as well, you know, QR codes. So, you know, I got the example here of the, uh, you know, have you ever found a rogue auto scrubber? I used to run custodial crews, so found the ro rogue auto scrubber, right? Where the heck does this go? Yeah, so where, where does this auto scrubber go? Well, I can scan it and go, it's not even in the right building anymore. Yeah, we, we, we have a system, we, and that's it works. You know, yep. So we, we manage that stuff. Yep, exactly, right? So yeah, Lumberg can be happy about that. Mm -hmm. All right, and then uh, I think we're at a couple minutes, so I'm gonna skip towards the end because everything else is pretty boring, honestly. Uh, but I just do wanna point out that, you know, we do work in higher ed. You know, I brought up WashU, we're working with them currently. Thank you for being such a great partner. Um, you know, so we're working with them. We're about to start phase, the third phase with, uh, with WashU hopefully this fall. Uh, and then we also work with Southeast Missouri State. Uh, so we've, you know, with WashU working to, to help them get, uh, get Maximo data in their system with Southeast Missouri State getting data in their TMA system. So again, we're a software company, but at the end of the day, we're a data company. And we understand that people need help getting that good data in. All right, and then uh, this, is, uh, this is a sneak peek at our software, right? It's location-based space and asset mapping for some of our clients as well. They use our work management system. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, we uh, really tried to take the best pieces of BIM, put it in our software, and then build on that to make it usable out in the field and to give you the information that you need at your fingertips. So, um, look at that, I got 45 seconds left. Um, so, I know we went through a lot of things, we saw a lot of GIFs. Uh, any, any questions? You track space information? In we track space information as well, so we've got some, we can run, uh, we've got some tools we can run to actually pull over 
uh, room schedule information into our system as well. So all, the, all those fields that you can see in Revit, we can pull all those over. It is Thursday. So. It is Thursday. It is, it is definitely a long day. But, but thank you. I, I've, this is my first time. Josh, like you said, has been coming for a decade. This is my first time. It is extremely refreshing to talk to an entire conference full of people who gets it. It is awesome. You and, may not have it, but you want yeah, it and you, you get it. it. Like, right. I get it. Yeah. And, and again, it, it's, it's great to come together as a community understand that we're all trying to get better together and there's plenty there, you know i tell people all the time there's plenty of buildings if you have another solution and you're happy with it i'm happy for you because there's a lot of buildings out there and there's a lot of there's pl there's plenty of buildings for all of us right in the in the space so and thank you for all you do because i know a lot of you are, are behind the scenes but you do great work for your institutions and they couldn't run without you so Thank you. Uh, enjoyed some barbecue tonight. And uh, if, you, if you came, we can hand out some, hopefully we'll have enough bucks for everybody. Uh, maybe you can use them for the, for the raffle tomorrow. So, all right. But, but thanks, folks. Definitely appreciate it. And uh, have a safe trip home tomorrow.